Okay, so from this point on, we're, whatever we say is being recorded. So um, hopefully there's no cat noises or dog noises, except for Brutus. Brutus is allowed to talk in the background. <laughs> so Jeannie, why don't, if we don't mind, if we could start with you. Where's your special place where you write and, and what was the genesis of Brutus? And did you hear Brutus in your, in your favorite place? And could you share a little bit? Okay, in our home, uh, I have what is a healing room. And uh, about 15 years ago, I, I was in a recovery program and sponsored some women that needed some private time. So I had a room here in the house and um, it's surrounded by windows and it looks out on the forest in the back. And um, we used to get together there one-on-one -on -one and, and do our homework and talk about recovery and healing and that sort of thing. So um, that's my quiet place. That's where I do uh, most of my deep thinking and that sort of thing. So um, I was in therapy. Uh, I have been off and on since 66, 1966. Uh, and in the early 20s, uh, 2007, I mean, um, my counselor encouraged me to write in a journal and I started writing and this story came out. And the story is about Brutus. He is a junkyard dog. He was me. Uh, I was raised in New York state, pretty much on the streets and rough and very angry. Um, because of my past. And so I would push people away. And Brutus is a junkyard dog. He is an angry dog, like I used to be. This is Brutus. Love it. Can you see him? Mm -hmm. Okay. So Brutus, I, I, and I wanted, I had him in my head and I never knew what he looked like. I wanted him to be somewhat mean and somewhat angry, but not scary since this is a children's book. So when um, I got in touch with a tennis, the illustrator, she created Brutus, the Brutus that was in my heart on paper. And um, she just took off with it. She has just now, while we've been on this meeting, sent me more illustrations she's on, on a roll here so uh we will probably have more illustrations than we need but um so in my therapy i learned why i was angry and what promoted that for a lifetime because i was in my early 60s then um and resolved the issues. And when I got to the other side of anger and pushing people away, a new world opened to me. So Brutus comes in contact with a caterpillar that turns into a butterfly and follows her out of his junkyard into a new world with beautiful uh, creatures and learns not to fight with the animals. And so that's really my story, my life story. Um, and it just kind of flowed out one day. And I must say, the second book has flowed out the same way. I just get on the computer and it just kind of comes. Uh, and then all you people help me perfect it like Barbara and Vincent, <laughs> my beta readers. <laughs> One of the things that, that MJ will probably talk about in, in, in a little bit is protecting that the brand. And I know that Jim Nettles had mentioned to you about protecting the brand as well. Um, that, you know, Brutus, protecting the name Brutus, protecting the junkyard dog, protecting the variations, but protecting beyond the book uh, to other ancillary uh, revenue streams, whether those are t-shirts or coffee mugs or whatever, emerges from that Brutus the Junkyard Dog story 
uh, it could it could be a vibrant way to uh, you know to engage uh, the the readers and move beyond that as well. So um, we'll we'll learn a little bit more about that. Uh, I'm not going to assign anybody else here. I'm going to ask for volunteers who'd like to go next and talk a little bit about what you're writing. Where's your favorite writing space? How do you collect your thoughts? Um, we're all friends here, so just raise your hand. I'll go. Um, my favorite place to write is anywhere where there's quiet. Um, my most special place is by the water. Um, I love to sit by the ocean because the ocean is where I see um, the Bible verse Genesis um, in the beginning. When I look at the waters, um, you never see the end. Um, and that's the way that I look at what God can do for me. It's never ending. Um, and I actually wrote that in my first book. Um, I explained a little bit about um, how that's my happy place or why that's my happy place, um, which is his life, our story, um, which derived from an organization that I started, Lock and Key Prison Life Aftermath, after my husband experienced um, 10 years in prison as a wife, after his supporter, I wanted him to excel um, in the process of me making sure that he was okay. I looked in the mirror one day and did not know who I was. Um, at this point, it's seven years later. Um, so on that seventh year, God started showing me who I was and showing me my purpose. So once I um, created um, the nonprofit Lock and Key, um, someone said to me, what's your follow-up? And I never understood what the follow-up was. You know, once we had a woman's conference, when you close out, how do people get back in contact with you? Um, and that's where the book came into place. So I started to put my experience inside of a book because once people see you in a conference, um, they see you for an hour, two hours, but where do it go from there? How do people really know the true body of who you are? So for me, I had to put it in a book. Um, and writing that book, it opened up um, other feelings because I had to allow myself to be vulnerable. Um, I had to deal with things that I didn't want to deal with. Um, I had to deal with life. Um, and as I dealt with that life, um, the second book evolved from that. Um, because where did, where did I even learn to love, you know, a man as such? You know, not that my husband is a bad man, but when we talk about um, someone in prison, we don't grow up and say, oh, I'm going to find someone in prison. Um, but I had to think about growing up in a poverty neighborhood, um, growing up, um, you know, in subsidized housing and things of that nature. It all plays a part because I'm only obsessive. I only had certain people, places, and things accessible to me. So I didn't know anything other than what was in front of me. So as I look back into my childhood, I had to go deeper, which, um, which led me into my second book, Adele in My Childhood Pain. And I had to really go deep into my childhood, things that I went in, things that I experienced, um, things that had me entrapped mentally um, as I continue on this journey, because it is a journey. Um, when you start opening up and taking off those different layers, um, taking those layers off made me see that I have something even more grand up under, you know, these different layers. And I want to see who that beauty queen is up under these layers. So I had to continue to do the work. And in the interim of doing that work, um, God told me that I was not, or I was not ordained to do in um, a book about my childhood because my mother is not ready to hear an entire book about her um, because I'm not born into myself. So it's still my story, but there are some pivotal characters inside of the book. Um, my mother being one of the main characters. So I expressed to God, so what am I supposed to do? Not say anything, not do anything. He said, I authorize you to write the book, but you have to do it with other people. And he told me for multiple reasons. One was because my mother couldn't deal with it by herself. Two is because I'm not the only one broken. There are so many other people that are broken. And three, if my mother is able to read the book, right, it might not penetrate the healing today, but she'll be able to look at it and understand that I'm not perfect and I'm not perfect not by myself. There's other parents. No one is, no one is giving birth to children with an instruction manual. Um, so he told me that that will become something that she would be able to embrace um, that will aid the healing process, not just for me, but for other people out there, because we're all healing, we're all healing or need to heal in some form. 
Um, and that's that's just where I am with it. Um, and in the process of this, um, it did open up opportunities to others because I'm sharing the experience. Um, as I stated in the beginning, um, you know, I did it in fun, basically, you know, um, it was something that I needed to do. I didn't really think about the logistics um, behind it and how to protect myself legally. I mean, I did put, of, of course, a contract in place, um, which gives me the rights to, you know, the body of the book. Um, but there's more, you know, like Vincent was just talking about uh, when you're talking about marketing books and things like cups and all these different things that you can add for extra revenue. Um, it definitely becomes a grimy place to be. Um, and that's where I am now. I'm trying to pro protect my intellectual properties so that I have not worked or produced a brand, right? Because it becomes a brand when you, you cannot trademark a book. But because Adele in my childhood pain is um, needed, it has turned into an idea that has now grown into a ongoing project and becoming a series. As a series, it can be conformed into a trademark because it becomes a brand. And that's where I am. And it, it, it's very costly. Um, and looking at the different things that I have to do now, I had to pump the brakes on everything. So I have like a list of maybe 100 people ready to go into the next book. Can I do it? No, I have to pump the brakes because now that I have a weekend, so let me just, just back up one quick um, minute. All of the ladies that are in my book, none of them ever met each other. I am the common denominator. So after we did the hard work, I thought that it was beneficial for everyone to actually physically meet. So I planned a writer's retreat. So this past weekend, we went to Hilton Head. And it was the very first time that everyone mingled. And it was 90% an excellent trip. We made great connections. Um, the interaction was good until the envious, the enviness um, came out. Um, and it was just something I just really wasn't prepared for. So I'm wrestling with that now. I'm wrestling with that because I want to make sure that I'm protected. I didn't do all this work for someone to snatch it from me. Um, I don't think nobody works and wanted to get snatched from them. So I'm, I'm, I'm hustling really hard to kind of figure this out legally um, within a, a 30 day time frame. Um, I don't know where it's going to come from financially, but I ask you guys to just lift me in prayer as I move on this journey. This is a journey that I wasn't even ready for. <laughs> This all started because of your daughter's book, right? So, yeah. Well, no, not even her book. Um, her book happened, um, but it wasn't even about her. It was just my journey with my husband. It's just how it started. Yeah. Um, if I never, if I never walked through a prison door, I don't even think that I would be here writing. Um, I never really realized how much I love to write. I mean, I've always wrote poetry, and you know, I I wrote in books. I like to write jingles, but to actually sit down and write, and it's like people tell me you've always been a writer. But you know, sometimes we don't have time, like we're moving so fast, right? Um, especially when you live in a city life. So when I live in a city, I move so fast, I didn't even realize how fast I was moving. I didn't realize the qualities and assets that I possess. And um, as I sit down and as I started writing, as I started going in a relationship, I realized this is a gift that God has given me. Because I write, you know, it's, it's natural for me. It's, it's natural for me to put it on paper. Well, to teach, well, you're a beautiful writer, and I love your story, so thank, thank you. you. Um, Barb, you had your hand up. Were you ready to uh, to share a little bit about your private place or quiet place? Okay, am I muted? Not, not now. Now you're fine. We okay, can all right. I can't tell anymore. I've been on so many of these meetings. Um, no, I, uh, I kind of feel sort of like the kid in school who gets away with being mm -hmm. mischievous because I write when something hits me and like three o'clock in the morning, the other morning, I got up to use the bathroom, went back to bed and all of a sudden I had a poem. So I got my phone and I dictated it to, to my phone and then fell, fell back asleep and got up in the morning and typed it up. It was like, okay. It's almost like, I don't like the word vomit, but you know what I mean? It's like, it just kind of out of me and I just go, oh, okay, another poem, all right. And they rhyme, I don't know why. And uh, they just are what they are. But the, the silly thing, I feel like, I feel silly. Um, 
my poem is about Weight Watchers of all things, because some people take it very, very seriously. I take it seriously for my health, not necessarily for losing a lot of weight. And I wrote this poem while well, I read it to the group I was in on Saturday morning and they all said, oh, you should, you should uh, put it out on the internet, you know, on the Weight Watcher internet thing, collect, connect or whatever it's called. And I said, no. And they said, why? And I said, cause it's mine and nobody's gonna steal it from me. And so what Tatish is talking about is making me realize that I don't even know how to go about taking care of any of that, like any of that. Like if I wanted to put that out on the internet, how do I prove that it's mine and people don't need to just go and take credit for it? Well, that's, that's a great segue. So I am gonna turn this over to MJ, who's gonna answer that question. Uh, in yeah, that MJ, help me. <laughs> yeah. Well, again, a lot of what each of you is discussing is in this handbook that I've uh, prepared. And I have copyrighted each version of this, okay? This book was scheduled to come out this month, but then I realized there were some glitches. I needed to get permission rights. I needed to pay you, Barb, to use your poem in my book a poem which you should copyright, okay? Uh, Tatisha, yes, Tatisha, the, the books, the material that you've done for this anthology must be copyrighted. That's rule number one. Even if it's in a rough draft, speeches, PowerPoint presentations that you do at conferences, Anything that is your intellectual property is to be copyrighted. Okay, let me give you an example of how this works. On the trademark and patent side, remember the name Thomas Edison and the light bulb? Uh, remember Ford and the automobile? Each of those men patented all of the rough drafts, all of the, the, the poorly operating engines and light bulbs until they perfected it. There then what was a pattern of their work on creating the light bulb, on creating the automobile because they patented and whatever the names were, they trademarked it. Now you, we can use the expression brand, but if it is written to Tisha, it should be copyrighted first. How? That's my I'm favorite. copywritten okay. already. Okay. The book is already, my book is already copywritten. I'm, I'm, okay. I'm beyond then, the copywriting then, part. Then, then no one has the right to use your copyrighted work without your permission. And they have to pay you for permission to use your work. Barb, once you copyright your poem, and I'll talk about that in a minute, if I use your poem in anything that I do for commercial purposes, I have to get your permission to use your poem in my book and I have to pay you for using your poem, okay? Uh, you all know the, the famous um, uh, entertainers who sing songs, who write the lyrics, who write the, uh, the music to, to movie scores. All that stuff is copywritten. Yeah, third for a word. Okay. And you and I cannot use it for commercial purposes without getting permission and paying to use it. Now, let me back up and, and I'll come back to you in a moment with that. As I said, um, I have spoken on becoming an independent author slash publisher for quite a few years at different uh, conferences. And it was some colleagues who after having seen the PowerPoint presentations and listening to the presentations on step one all the way to the end, suggested that I do this handbook. Uh, I sent Vincent a copy of the table of contents that's actually in the book. Part of the reason it's not available this month, I thought it was going to be available this month, is because I'm still securing permission rights. For example, I referenced quite a bit of material 
from the Chicago Manual of Style. Okay, that's a reference book, right? MJ, would it be helpful if I put that uh, PowerPoint that you shared up on the screen? The table of content? Yes. Yes. Okay, let me go do that. Okay. And so, okay, well then I'll, I'll go according to, to what's in it and, and uh, then I'll spend time uh, uh, sharing with each of you, um, you know, answering your questions. So in the table of contents, once you get past about the author, who she consults his handbook, um, and by the way, let me say who should consult the handbook, okay? Uh, where is that page? <laughs> okay. 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 Anyone who desires to write, but who has yet to put pen or pencil to paper or fingers to a keyboard. Anyone who writes, but is unfamiliar with the publishing industry and desires to enter it. Anyone who has written some darn good narratives is experiencing problems landing a literary agent and needs a, uh, a shove to self-publish. I start off by asking, what inspires you to write? I've listened to different ones of you. You already have the inspiration. Your inspiration may not, however, be the content that you write about, okay? Then I give an overview of what's happening with the hybrid and independent publishing industry. Hybrid publishers or, or, or publishers who publish your book for a fee. Traditional publishers are publishers that a literary agent gets for you and sells your manuscript to the publisher and they do all the work for you and you know talk about royalties, et cetera. I'm an indie author, independent. I do all the work myself. I do not have a literary agent. Okay, um, and it is the, the indie uh, authors and publishers that are growing and that are making up those two million plus books that are on Amazon each year. Um, I give information about writing standards for fiction. Sorry, I don't do nonfiction, but I give writing standards, not my writing standards, but the field writing standards. I give resources to help you with that. And then I have five rules that I follow. One, I say writing is a private affair. Now, whether you agree with that, that or not, I then ask you to make note on why you agree or disagree with that, that particular rule. But for me, writing is a private affair. It is not something that I share with anybody. Once you share your idea, your concept with someone else, and you have not copyrighted it, you stand to lose it. Let me say that one more time. You may have an excellent idea, but don't you call a conference of 100 people to teach you, or don't you call a conference a bar of 100 people and read your poem to them and you haven't copyrighted it, okay? Right. You must protect your intellectual property. You go online to the US Copyright Office and it, it'll walk you through how to do it. And yes, you have to pay to copyright. Okay, but I contend and will fight to the end. Writing is a private affair. What you write about is between you and your editor, nobody else. And you can talk to your loved ones and give them an idea, da, da, but don't tell them mm -hmm. what you are writing about. Rule number two. I listened to some of you talk about how you're distracted when you try to work at home, whatever. Successful authors write every day. Well, almost every day. Okay, one of you said that you woke up in the middle of the night and this poem came to you and you recorded it. And the next morning you wrote it. That's an example of what I mean. Okay, that's an example of what I mean. Um, but writing, for serious authors is not a pastime. It is not a pastime. This is something you do all day, night, every day of the week, every day of the year. People who write find time to write, okay? Um, you have to decide when and where you write. You have to know what the distractions are, okay? For most people who are easily distracted, 
you need to set aside time. Someone mentioned Maya Angelou, you know, going to the a hotel or something. The cheaper way is to go to the library and write two, three hours a day. And then go back home or back to the office or whatever you do or back to your yard work. But you must set aside time to write and whatever you do, don't use distractions as an excuse. Prolific writers find a way, a place, and a means to write. Okay. On my rule number four, I contend that writing is meant to be read. Some people say, well, I write because it helps my nerves and therapy, or this was so whatever I wanted to share it with other people. But there are also people who write and refuse to publish their writing, refuse to take it out the shoebox and share it with other people. My argument for my regimen is writing is meant to be read. Imagine what we would be today if we had not uh, found the Dead Sea Scrolls. What about the diary of Anne Frank? Don't take your writing for granted. It is advantageous. It is beneficial to somebody. Okay. And if I sound like I'm very serious about this, I haven't been writing for the past 20 years for my health. It's because I believe the writing is meant to be read, okay? Uh, and finally, uh, I, oh, and so under that part about writing is meant to be read, I give lots of information I've gotten from creative writing standards and books, and I share that with, um, you know, the readers, whether you're, you're going to speak in, for example, the first person narrator, or you're gonna speak in the third person, or you're gonna speak in the omniscient voice, um, I talk about setting your, your scene, your setting. I talk about developing the protagonist or your main character. There are lots of writing standards that people who do creative writing must follow, okay? Uh, Nelson DeMille writes one way. Uh, Adichie writes one way. Uh, author, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle wrote one way. Their style, do not confuse style with standard. They're all following the same standards. Standards are universal. Um, now, the other part that I talk about in here are the essentials of publishing. The first one is budget for your writing career. You cannot be a writer without a budget. Let me be very clear, okay? You cannot be a writer without a budget. You need paper, you need pens, you need ink cartridges, you need a computer. You need a printer. Or a, you understand what I'm saying? You need the proper equipment and tools. And you have to pay for that. Okay? Uh, so budget for that. You need an attorney. You need an accountant. Okay? Those of you saying, you know, this happened to me, whatever. Your attorney and your accountant are there for a reason. They will help you get copyrighted. They will help you. Okay? Uh, do your taxes. They will guide you along the way. They will even help you with your uh, permission rights and so on. Um, and so I kind of alluded to step two when I said if you're serious about writing is equip yourself with the proper tools. You need the latest dictionary. You need the latest uh, Chicago Manual of Style. You need the latest World Atlas because you're not just going to talk about Salisbury, North Carolina or Matthews. Where else in the world are you going to reference? And you've got to get those names of those places and countries correct, okay? Um, you need um, antivirus software. You need the latest Microsoft Office suite. You need Adobe. You, you need all kinds of software. You're going to put your book in a certain format. You need a certain software to do that. Let's say you want to do ebook conversion. You need software to do that, okay? And I talk about all that in here. Uh, so your budget, you got to get the proper tools. You need a competent editor. Not your sister or your mom who you like and she likes the way you write, but a, unless, of course, they're professionals. Okay, that's different. And I tell you in the book the different sites where you go to interview and land a, 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 an editor who edits your type of writing. I may be an editor, but I may not edit the type of stories that different ones of you are talking about. There are websites you can go to, enter certain uh, keywords and a list of editors who write, who edit the type of material you write about will come up. Then you 
read their backgrounds, learn about them, do your research, and then you interview them and decide which one you want. And you will pay them. They have a fee structure, okay? And most of them are in a professional association or some kind of union. Um, the, the publishing essentials, numerous. You need a professional headshot. You need a professional name. You need an employer ID number. Okay, you writing is a business. Okay, you may be the only employee, but you got to pay taxes on what you're doing with your writing, especially if you're selling books or whatever you're selling. Um, I have a piece in there about a word about permission rights. I just alluded to that. You and I cannot use someone else's copyrighted material uh, in our anything we're selling, which reminds me, uh, Vincent. I've now got to go back to Ed Sullivan or someone to get permission to actually print that information that you know you took off the website and sent me about the, the North Carolina Writers Network uh, website. I need permission. I need permission to use that. And I'm praying that when I ask for it, they won't charge me, okay? Um, I can't speak for Red, but uh, he's the right guy to be talking with. And I noticed in your book too, MJ, that you referenced uh, uh, Jim Nettles. By the way, Jim just joined the call here, so welcome, Jim, to the call. We're we're discussing, uh, we're going in a, a round table uh, discussion, and uh, MJ was just sharing this new author's book that she's put out, uh, which references your book as one. Of the yeah, and I was very happy to to be mentioned or to to give permission for that. So I'm I'm very grateful for for getting a little credit there. But I've been nodding vigorously to everything you've been saying. <laughs> Oh, good. Thank you. Thank you. I'll see. I did the edit. Oh, and the publishing essential permission rights. Okay. Copyright. It shows. Okay. It doesn't just tell you this stuff, people. It gives you the actual web address to go to, to do a copyright. You know, it, it, I, I put in there the U.S. Copyright Office website. I don't just tell you to do it. I show you how to do it. And I tell you what to expect, you know, that you've got to register an account. You've got to, you know, put in certain information. Then it's going to ask you all these questions about you as the author and the, the type of work. And I, okay, um, it, it, it took a book, so I'm not going <laughs> to try and tell you everything just in this conversation. Um, there's something called a pre-assigned control number. You need to, to have a, a succinct biography about yourself, a synopsis of your work, what your book is about. Um, what else is in there? Oh, and then it shows you how to apply for an ISBN number, a price barcode, all of which you need different for each format. A print book has one ISBN number and price barcode. An ebook has another ISBN and price barcode, an audio book, and so on. Okay. And it, it, sh it shows you how to do all that and it tells you there's a fee for this, okay, or not. Uh, then I do a whole piece on uh, a word about pricing. I had to learn this the hard way, okay? <laughs> I had to learn this the hard way. So I won't go into all the details, but once you, let's say, put your book up and let's say Ingram, Ingram Spark is your distributor. It's going to ask you the price of your book. You put it in. It's got four or five other countries on that little uh, a table. You need to understand the difference between the U.S. dollar the British pound sterling, and so on, and so on, and so on. Okay. Well, MJ, I, I'm watching the clock here because I'm a, I'm supposed to be a timekeeper too. One of the, the takeaways here to the short answer to Barb's question about copyright uh, is that that information is in the book. What I like about yeah. your book is that you've written it for the range of authors and writers from someone who has not yet published anything to someone who's published something to people who have written three, four or more books. And so you can dig as deeply as you need to with, with, the, um, with the book that you're making available in the marketplace. Um, I assume that's going to be available on Amazon. Will it be in other it's places? It'll be, it'll be in the usual, <laughs> the usual places. You're right, Amazon, my website and anywhere else which, which is, and I'm glad Jim came on. Let, let me say two things real quick. There are some other works that I reference in here. For example, I reference uh, Jim's book a lot. I don't know all that technology and stuff, okay? 
he does what I really love about his his his, his book is he says forget the starving artist be the thriving. I mean, I love that statement, but most important, I, he's got all these technical details that we as writers just don't think about. We don't understand. And so for that, I, I constantly refer the reader to uh, Nettles, da-da-da-da-da, Nettles, da-da-da-da-da. I'm doing the overview, the nuts and bolts of, of, of operating your writing career as a business, that's a gym. Okay. That's I'm just here to be a bad influence. That's all. <laughs> uh, and there are two or three other authors, you know, that I reference in that respect. But what I'm saying is, is I'm simply sharing with the reader what my experience has been over the past 20 odd years to move from being completely ignorant about the publishing industry to learning the hard way how to not only write better, but to publish my work myself. Now here's the irony, and I'm done. Remember I told you that my fifth novel was not one about terrorism and all of that, about the, the mysterious affair at the Met, the Metropolitan Museum of Art. I get to this point, and now I have a doggone publisher. What's in this book is what it has taken me to get my work out there myself. And now that I, I know how to do it, I got a publisher. Okay, so I guess indirectly what I'm trying to suggest to you is just keep at it. Just keep at it. Someone is going to see your work and pick you up and move it in direction unimaginable. Okay, I had entered a book contest for fiction, women fiction writers in the US and Canada. I did not win the $250,000 award but my book got noticed by an acquisitions editor at a publishing house, okay? And, and, and that was least expected. I didn't have a literary agent, okay? So I'm trying to uh, be as encouraging as possible to you, um, no matter where you are in the writing process. And as, 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 as uh, Vincent said, it talks to the novice, someone who's just getting started, but it also provides information for those who are tad more advanced, okay? And there are lots of, um, as I say, references in here for even more specific, more specific information, you know, other resources that you can use. But this, this dog and a book like it gave me a headache, okay? It's technical, it's a lot of information, but it was only toward the end that I realized that I needed two more permissions before I could do anything. The North Carolina Writers Network for the, the website material that I list and the Chicago Manual of Style. Yes, you have to get permission right from reference books like the Chicago Manual of Style to use their material in your book if it's for commercial purposes. MJ, one, one last question about your book. Is it going to be available electronically? And the second part of that question is, will there be hyperlinks to all of these resources in that e it's this right now is only going to be in hardcover. Um, I have, and I talk about in the book, I had a bad experience with an ebook once that was somebody uploaded it online. So when you say internet to me, my, my tentacles rise. Hmm. No, this will be an old fashioned paper book, okay? Uh, hardcover, and I will have to sleep on it to decide if it will ever be an ebook. All right, thank you. Okay, we have about a half hour left. Who else would like to share a little bit about where you write? Jim, Tom, Tommy Doonan. Yes, sir. Hello, everybody. Um, I'll make this brief, <clears throat> excuse me, but hopefully interesting. Um, I have two places that I write. First is everywhere. And second is here, where I'm sitting. When I say everywhere, that's if, if I know I've got some ideas for a very short piece thousand words or less, a piece of flash fiction, a, a commentary, a quick little essay, I can literally write that anywhere. If, if I'm working on a longer piece, um, a short story, a novel, uh, a self-help book, 
Um, I do it in this office that you see with the books around me and that gives me ins inspiration and whatever. So, um, and I the, the, probably the COVID has hurt me the most and not having coffee shops that I could go to because I'd love to go to a coffee shop with quick ideas and the sort of the chaos that sort of surrounds you, but you don't really hear the chaos in a coffee shop to, to knock out some quick ideas there. Um, so those are the two places I wrote, right everywhere and here. And uh, with that, I'd like to give an example of a, read like seven or eight lines of a piece that, uh, that I wrote everywhere and everywhere meaning, uh, I guess it was a Memorial Day weekend. I went out for a small family reunion and this is at 6 a.m. in a hotel in Alexandria, Virginia. And I'll just read you the first seven or eight lines that just came. Um, it's, it's, it's a one pager, but I'll just read the first number of lines. An idea fell. An idea fell with a weight of a lifetime of restlessness, cognizant of the destructiveness of mankind, otherwise known as planet Earth's civilization. The thought was one of certainty of the equality of every human being. Am I alone with this thought? I know not whence it came, thinking from the far side of the moon, a ring of Saturn, Europa, or a mother star with time running against me from an expanding distant galaxy. My death is inescapable. Will the thought then die? Is there an end to equality? Is a war promoting inequality winning? And that's how I started my morning in Alexandria, Virginia, about a month ago. Sabah. What an, what an appropriate setting, right? And, and not far from the right. Not far from the cemetery where tens of thousands are buried. Wow. Right. And and MJ, thank you for calling me out and putting me on the carpet, because I know for the past month I have spent too much time outside, and not in here. So I will religiously find a way to limit my time out that, that window right there, even though I like to do what I do. But thank you very much. Thank you. Um, who else would like to share a little bit about where is your quiet place? Um, Christina? Yes. Go ahead. Uh, oh, Audrey. Oh, Audrey, you I like to. OK, Christina, I thought I saw your hand first. And then Audrey, right after Christina, yourself? OK, Christina, go ahead. OK, I'm sorry. I like to write like in a dark, quiet place. And uh, that's all my thoughts. Just like, I have so many thoughts. It's just like, I can't imagine, you know, like the imagination. When I start writing, I was like, wow, it, I just get creative. And right now I'm working basically at the time when I had the accident. So I'm just going over about my complex regional pain syndrome how it affected my life and my pain and through my journey. And uh, it's pretty powerful, you know, at the end. So I, I, I started to, you know, I basically, I'm the sixth page in, so we're going another 150 pages. So I still have a way to go, to go over, to make sure it's, it's the way I want it, you know, to be sounded. And then my childhood also about my trauma, everything, that part, you know, my, that I survived sexual harassment, uh, my parents, you know, not being in my life and how I had to learn to be on my own. And um, also about my parents, you know, battling addiction, one, my father, and then about my mom, you know, that she was very sick to take care of us. So writing, it kind of, I found like a healing and understanding like each one of us with the way, you know, basically we are. So I learned to forgive. I forgave them and I just healed. You know, I, I looked at things in a positive way. So that's how basically I look at this moment in my life. You know, I, I through my accident, all the anger and everything I had towards my family I learned to forgive and now, you know, it's it's the time that I write down that I basically understand each one and why they were like that because they were they were battling something. And 
you know, it's it's healing for me. I, I you I was privileged to read basically three different manuscripts. You had three stories going separately, and and the way you're combining the physical pain with the emotional pain with the spiritual pain and the growth in each one of those areas, I think is phenomenal. I think you're you're going to have a bestseller, Christina. So uh, thank you. Glad we were able to spend some time with you and Steve at the uh, at the coffee shop here in Mount Pleasant. That was that was fun. We'll do that again. Um, Definitely, but, you know. Maybe one time you could come to see where we are by the lake. Absolutely. Thank you. Yes. I'll Audrey, make dinner. <laughs> Audrey, you had your hand up next. I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, everybody's touched me. Uh, but first of all, I have to admit my guilty secret is that I like to write at the kitchen table. And uh, it started when I was a little girl. I did my homework at the table. And... Um, because my children are all grown and it's just my husband and I, we write at the table. Now we have a table that's just our writing table, but it's in a big open part of the house. And, but it's our writing table because I like to surround myself with all those things like MJ has. I have all my references over here and I like to surround myself with my references and it looks real messy, but Larry and I are sitting there with our little computers and going back and forth and talking and writing. Um, so I like to write at a, at a table and that's why we did our series about table talk because we like to sit at the table and talk or, and write. Um, but uh, to, uh, to Tisha, I uh, made the mistake that you did not make when you were choosing not to tell your mother's story all at one time. Um, uh oh, I lost everybody. Okay, T uh, using uh, because I told a lot about my children and they were angry with me for a while, uh, but we all got over it and it helped us all to heal. Was to finally say things out loud. So that's a note. And to uh, Jean, we are the thing that we are embarking on is writing a story about our dog, as with the mind of someone with ADHD, which is what we write about. And our dog, because we think the dog really does have ADHD. But, uh, um, you know, finding that illustrated because my husband has a thousand pictures of the dog doing all this stuff, but I'd still like to find an illustrator. And I was wondering how you found a teenager. Well, um, I contacted all the art, um, teachers in the high school that is down the block from me here in Matthews. I just sent an email to all the art uh, teachers and asked them if they could refer me to a student who they thought was, would be interested in illustrating a book. I mean, it was that simple. Mm. Um, one teacher replied out of all the emails and one student applied out of all the students. And I think that was God working. Absolutely. Uh, and, and she uh, has now been approached by another author to illustrate mm -hmm. the possibility of illustrating a book. And so she is well on her way. She's just a brilliant artist. And her, the way her mind can draw what's in my heart just spoke volumes to me, how talented she is. She's a real love. Thank you. You are. That's, all I, that's all I have to say. Okay, one of the things that Jeannie learned along the way, uh, thanks to Jim uh, Nettles, who's on this call, is that you want to set up a contractual arrangement with that illustrator. Oh yeah, I learned that with my book. I yeah. learned that with book cover, yeah. So it's in, in a children's book is quite a challenge, uh, a whole different vocabulary. And I know Barb Baker's uh, had taken a look at your book. So uh, yes. yeah, yeah, it's it's a process, you guys. There's a fine line, and, and I don't know the answer to this, between sharing and sharing widely uh, and not sharing at all. Uh, we in this group have shared our collective works with each other selectively. Uh, we've, beta, we've done beta reads for each other's books. Um, and, and I think at some point, and, and I hear what MJ was saying before, but I think, think at some point you do have to trust a little bit uh, to get some validation so you're not writing in isolation 
Uh, you're not you're not doing this all by yourself. And at some point, you do have to reach out and uh, look for some some other authors, some other writers, and some other professionals like Jim that uh, that can help you, um, you know, along the way. So can I comment? Yes. Thanks, part, part of what I'm assuming is that everybody has a professional editor. Mm -hmm. Okay, so do all of you have an editor? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, if you yes. are a professional editor, that, that's the, the first step, okay? Uh, I mean, if you just absolutely have to tell somebody, talk to your editor, you know, whom you have a contractual relationship of non-disclosure. Mm -hmm. But just be careful. And, and, and I, I hear you, uh, Vincent, I hear you. Yeah. I'm, I'm not being absolute in saying don't talk to anybody else. But people, uh, Tatisha was right. There are people out there who will take your intellectual property. So be careful uh, as to uh, whom you share your information. That's all I'm saying. At least this is a professional gathering, okay? So that 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 provides some uh, for, for protection here, but be careful how you share your information about what you're writing. I, I can't stress that enough. Uh, well, but if you got yeah, it, yeah. you, know, you don't have to worry about all that. What's I, can, oh, I said okay. if you have an editor, you don't have to worry about all who you can talk to. Well, Jim, you got a comment? To the editor. <laughs> Yeah, I was actually going to jump in just a little bit if you guys don't mind. The first thing I want to say is absolutely get you an ed get you a good professional editor. The other thing I'm going to say is make sure it's a, somebody that's a good fit for you. Yeah. Somebody can be the best editor on the planet in your genre, and the two of you can get along beautifully, and it becomes a fantastic experience. Your editor is going to be able to bring out and polish your work fantastically. The wrong editor mm -hmm. can create something that is already in great shape and create a disaster. Mm -hmm. um, and I've seen both things happen. And but those are pretty much extremes. But it, you want to make sure the editor you're working with is really somebody that you can work with because it becomes a matter of both of your work. Because the editor, a really good editor is going to be somebody that can polish your work just like a gemstone. Yeah. They're gonna they're gonna find those beautiful cuts, they're gonna turn it into the thing that, that really gleams and polishes for you. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's a really critical thing. It's not just about the trust, it's about having that person that is going to be able to have the same view, the same idea, but also be different enough to show you the thing, your blind spots. Because the good editor is gonna bring out those blind spots and say, I know you think you said this, you didn't say that. But I know you think you did. Yeah. Um, and I, that's, that's one of those things about working with a good editor is a tremendous amount of fun. And it's one of those things where it will make you a better writer. Mm -hmm. A good editor will, it, the, the number one job of a good editor is to make you a better writer. And then also make you feel guilty about all the red on the page. So it's, that's <laughs> all the red. We've, we've been blessed to work with several really, really good editors. The, the North Carolina Writers Network, by the way, has a stable of editors that you can, if you're a member of that organization, of our organization, you can take advantage of that. Uh, I know Jim is working with, with several editors in his organization. So um, yeah, when you're ready for that, that's absolutely the right place and right way to go. Um, and thinking just in the, in the development stage, though, as you're looking at beta readers, uh, their job is not to line edit your book. It's not even to content edit your book. It's just to, I think, give you a flavor. Are you on the right track? Do you have a story that's that's appealing to to a particular audience? Uh, I've had the privilege of, of looking at Christina's uh, manuscript and Jeannie's manuscript, uh, Tommy and I looking at his manuscript, um, Tatisha, yeah. Uh, Audrey, I didn't get the chance to see yours in initially, but uh, final product. Uh, and MJ, you were well on your way with three books before we got to get to know each other. But uh, I, I, and I'm watching Barb, she, I don't see her face on here. She stepped away from the screen. 
But I think one of the um, the real benefits and the real joys of belonging to a group like this is seeing that work coming to life and seeing that work, you know, take uh, take form right in front of you, and and uh, and to be able to offer what little advice and hopefully good advice you, you can as a as a fellow writer. Uh, to make sure you get the best product you can get out there and then get it to that content editor and then get it finally to the line editor where they get all that red that Jim's talking about. Um, it's, it's a process, you guys and ladies. So did, did I miss anyone in the, in the uh, round table? I don't see another hands going up. Well, I, I was going to throw one more thing out there just about sure. writing because this is, this is such a great group of, of folks and I've had so much fun hanging out with you guys and work with you guys when you're trying to find the right or when you're when you're talking about where do you write how do you write when do you write it's whatever works for you um but there's two things i'm going to encourage and tommy was absolutely right where where do you write everywhere where do you edit where you're comfortable but one of those things that that i do also encourage is when you're trying to write and be creative change your environment it's been kind of hard for the last year and a half you know, coffee shops not being open, things like this. But when you're writing and creating, being somewhere that you're not entirely comfortable will bring out the most creative parts of what you're doing. Find places that have life to them, that have energy to them. You know, and that could be sitting in the coffee shop, that could be sitting in the park. Um, you know, that could be anywhere, but changing your environment and cha changing the people you're around, if, especially if you're stuck, if you get stuck in the writing process, go somewhere else, do something different, and it'll help every time. May not mean the work is better, but at least it, it helps, it changes things, and change is always the thing that'll help get you moving again. But edit where you're comfortable and where it's quiet. But yeah. I say this having sat and written in, air, in airports and edited a city on a plane, and I, I can't recommend anybody else do the crazy things I've done, but you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, Jim, your, your advice always is, you know, well taken here. The, uh, you know, as I look at, at the group, as, as we work together uh, as, a, as a team of writers, we're fortunate to have access to the North Carolina Writers Network. Last, yesterday, we, Christine and I were on a Zoom call for creative writing uh, that was sponsored by the network. And the, the North Carolina Writers Network is going to have a, uh, finally in July, uh, a, a whole conference that's going to be a hybrid, I believe, but it's going to be in person. And as far as I know, we're going to be allowed to meet again at the good old coffee shop in Kannapolis in August. Uh, I'm waiting for final clearance from, uh, from the, the association before we can do that. But I think when we all get together again in person, we can celebrate everything that we've done during this last 14 months in trying to stay together as a team and and continuing to write even through the COVID. Um, one of the writers who's not with us today, she was a guest speaker, I believe last month or the month before, uh, is, is writing a, uh, a short story about 9-11 because it'll be ready for the anniversary of 9-11 in September, a uh, story that'll appear in the Trail Tales column that we mentioned before. Uh, but I think collectively this group probably could think about writing an anthology of how we, how we braved the COVID restrictions, how we wrote through the COVID restriction. I think that would be a, a fun little write and, uh, you know, honoring what Tatisha said. Yeah, let's, you know, we, we can brand it somehow and protect the brand as the, uh, the Metro North region, uh, but then just have the, have something we could put out there and maybe make the, uh, you know, the, the proceeds from that kind of a book available for new and aspiring writers to encourage them to, to write regardless of how well they are. I'm, I'm just throwing this as an idea out there, but uh, there's so much talent in this room and, and beyond the other folks who weren't able to join us tonight, but um, we did record this, so it'll be available. They'll be able to uh, weigh in and see if that's something you guys are all interested in, in your spare time, <laughs> whatever that is. But uh, I am I am mindful of the, of the clock and we always promise to end promptly at eight o'clock and we have four minutes left. Are, are there any kind of final comments or ideas or if, if not, we'll proceed on with uh, the beautiful sunset that's uh, approaching here. And Tatisha, I see your I'm battery is tonight. I got you. 
thank you everybody for being on this call. Uh, sincerely, uh, it, it, it's a joy and I look forward to doing this again in July. And I hope in August we'll be able to meet back at, at uh, French Express. So y'all, sounds good. Thank you. Thank, uh, thank you so much, Vincent. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Thumbs up. Thank you. Have a